Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Temenos Academy, and also to the Brunswick Group. And as always, our profound thanks to Alan Parker and the Brunswick Group for making us so welcome in this wonderful building, which we're very lucky to have. Um, now, you may or may not have been told that, unfortunately, tonight, Samuel Taylor Coleridge is unable to be with us. Um, but we have, I'm sure you'll agree, the very best possible substitute in the form of Dr. Malcolm Geit, um, who is well known to many members of Temenos as a magnificent speaker and was last here speaking to us for one of our Shakespeare um, celebration lectures um, last year. Um, Malcolm Geit is a notable poet. Um, he has a series of volumes of poetry, some of which I think are available at the entrance, and he is, um, I think it's fair to say, an important contemporary Christian poet. Um, and his books include a sonnet sequence, Sounding the, Se the Seasons, and uh, a collection of um, poems which are not sonnets and of broader subjects called The Singing Bowl, which I commend to you strongly. Um, he has also recently edited two anthologies, um, one of which is The Word in the Wilderness, a poem a day for Lent, Holy Week and Easter, and just hot off the press, Waiting on the Word, a poem a day for Advent, Christmas and Epiphany. Um, he's also written two um, very important prose books, um, one of which, a, a, a concise and crystal clear but also inspiring summary entitled What Do Christians Believe from Granta, and um, a, a, a book which I think is one of the, con one of the central contemporary explorations of, of the spiritual and imaginative function of poetry, um, which is Faith, Hope and Poetry from Ashgate. Um, Malcolm has said that the central thread that holds his work together is um, a belief in imagination as a truth-bearing faculty, um, which I think is absolutely and centrally um, a part of the worldview of Temenos and of our founder, Dr. Kathleen Wayne. So, um, it's a very great pleasure to welcome Malcolm once again. Um, Malcolm is in the process of writing um, an important book on Coleridge, which shares the title of this lecture, which is Mariner, A Voyage with Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The book will be out from Hodder, we hope, in 2017. In the meantime, Malcolm is here to speak to us now a Voyage with Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greville, That's, uh, for that kind introduction. It's good to be here again. I remember coming and enjoying um, A Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest in various ways with many of you. It's actually a particular pleasure to be addressing Temenos on Coleridge because uh, although my very first encounter with Kathleen Rain was through reading Blake and the Tradition and just being hugely helped by that book. Um, but in, I think it was Defending Ancient Springs, she had a very, very good essay on Coleridge, which again opened up aspects of Coleridge to me that I hadn't seen. So uh, what a pleasure to come and share my, my uh, enthusiasm for Coleridge uh, with uh, Temenos. And uh, as many of you may know, there's a very fine statue of Kathleen Rain in our fellow's common room at Girton. So I, I, I could say that I sort of see her most days, you know, sort of. It's a lovely, she's kind of arching back and stroking a cat. And uh, uh, so, it, so it's, it's good to be, to be here in your midst. So I want to talk uh, about Coleridge and what he has to offer, particularly about this central theme that I'm coming more and more to feel is is vital for our own age and for where we're likely to find ourselves, which is to rediscover and re-engage with the imagination as truth-bearing, as telling us things we need to know about what is the case. 
uh, rather than providing some sort of private subjective compensation for the, the dreariness of a, of a value-free and, and merely quantitative world. I think Coleridge is central for that. Uh, but I particularly want to, to reflect on the rhyme of the ancient mariner and to, to offer it again, as it were, to you as, as an astonishingly prescient and prophetic poem. He uh, began writing it, as I'm sure many of you know, in 1797 in... November when he and Wordsworth were off on a walking tour and they, as being poets of course were poor and, and, and they needed to defray the expenses of their walking tour and Wordsworth thought it'd be a nice idea that they could sort of toss off a quick gothic ballad, you know, they're in fashion now and it, Wordsworth was very optimistic, thought they might get a fiver for it and, um, you know, so they were going to do it together. And um, then, unusually, Coleridge found himself composing faster than Wordsworth, and Wordsworth having, having offered one line to the poem, which was, he listens like a three years child, um, sort of lit the blue touch paper and stood back. And Coleridge uh, got the bit between his teeth. And I think what made it, well, there are many things, including, I think, sheer grace and prescient gift that, that uh, enabled uh, Coleridge to write such an extraordinary poem at the ages, on the cusps of the ages of 25 and 26. Extraordinary. Begun in the autumn, uh, when the November of 1797, finished in one sense, finished as it would appear in the following year in the lyrical ballads, finished in March of 1798, by which time, of course, it was no longer the little poem that was going to buy them sort of beer and sandwiches on their walk. Uh, it, they missed they missed the publisher's deadline for the magazine that was going to put that. And by that time, it had gone up to 300 lines, which was probably more. And by the time he was finished with it, at that stage, it was 600 lines. Um, and it appeared famously in, in uh, the Lyrical Ballads. Of course, anonymously, that book, uh, both, I think, the first and the second editions, epoch-making <laughs> book, was published anonymously. In fact, they didn't realize quite what they'd done. They sort of, they, they, they left the book with Joseph Cottle to be published in, in Bristol and took off to Germany, the two of them, and, you know, didn't realize what all the fuss was about <laughs> until they got back. Um, but uh, Coleridge never left the poem quite to be. It continued to work with him and indeed almost began to haunt him until it gradually dawned on him that somehow he'd written his own life story before it happened an episode after episode with a kind of uncanny accuracy and sometimes a dreadful accuracy began to occur. And just later, much later in his life, he began to refer to himself in different ways as the mariner. But I think he wrote a poem that was not only prescient of his own life, and he finally republished it years later, in 1817. That's the first time the poem had his name on it. The first time the poem had the magnificent and I think all important gloss that sort of is in conversation with the poem itself, and I'll talk about that later. That came out in, in 1817 uh, in the book interestingly titled Sibylline Leaves. Coleridge identify himself, identifying himself with a, a female prophetess. Um, and. Uh, the text I'll be referring to is the, uh, the Sibylline Leaves text. He made some very small changes even towards the very end of his life. Um, so I want to talk about that poem as prescient and prophetic, hence the Sibyl, uh, not only of Coleridge's own personal life, but of our own age and of some of the very deepest dilemmas that we face now. Uh, so that's the, the broad frame. And I'm hoping to do this in a more thorough way in the course of the book I'm writing, which is, I hope, going to come out timed for the 200th anniversary of the publication of The Mariner in Sibylline Leaves. Um, so that was in 1817, and I hope mine will be out by 2017. It's the tale, of course, um, of a journey that starts in high hopes and good spirits, leads to a terrifying encounter with human fallibility, with darkness, with alienation, with loneliness and dread, 
and then, through a transfigured vision, arrives at a new reverence for nature, a profound experience of prayer, before uh, coming home to a renewal of faith and vocation. And I think that pattern, the starting in high hopes, the terrifying encounter with human fallibility, the dreadful loneliness, the agonies and the nightmares, and then the transfigured vision and the renewed experience of nature, the return to a, a deep grounding in the transcendent and spiritual that nevertheless is bedded in with and transfigures the particular and the imminent. That is the story of Coleridge's life. Uh, and um, the sense of the poem as prescient and as somehow in conversation with its own future is also there in um, two of the, the sort of framing devices in the poem as we have it from Sibylline Leaves. The first of which, as you may remember, is that the poem starts with the ancient mariner stopping a young man who is one of three young men, young gallants, off to a wedding. You know, it is an ancient mariner, he stoppeth one of three, by thy long grey beard and glittering eye. Now, wherefore stops thou me? That's the question that's posed right at the beginning. And it's posed not only by the young man, but in a sense it's posed by the poet to the reader. Why has this poem stopped you now? How is it going to turn you? Um, the question, wherefore stops thou me, is not answered till the end of the poem, when we're told, the mariner says that he's been given this penance to go through the world and to tell again this transforming story, and that he goes only to those who are, as it were, predestined and given and disposed and shown him in a kind of divine intuition as the people who need to hear it. The moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. That's why the one of three. It's a poem that finds its listener, finds its reader, and transforms that person. But that framing device of the older man who stops the younger man and tells the younger man a story which changes the younger man's life seems to me, I sometimes think, particularly as I've been reading through all of Coleridge's letters and journals and realizing how profoundly he kept on having to find phrases from this poem much, much later, long after he'd written it, to account for what was happening him, to him. I almost uh, sometimes think that it's almost as though, um, I know, I hope this doesn't sound too Doctor Who kind of timey-wimey uh, stuff. It's almost as though the, the older Coleridge has travelled back. You know that question they ask you, what would you say to your younger self if you could go back and find your 16-year-old self? You know, what would you say to them? And you get that kind of thing on Facebook. It's always something incredibly trite. Uh, can you imagine, you know, what I would say to them is, <laughs> the whole of the ancient mariner, you know. <laughs> I'd say alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a one took pity on my soul in agony. Oh, well, don't say that. <laughs> but it's almost as though the older Coleridge has gone back and given the younger Coleridge something, <laughs> and the younger Coleridge has put it down and then has to grow in to what it is. So that's one framing device. But the other framing device is, of course, the gloss which was indeed written by the old Coleridge. Um, he pretends, in the, the, the poem is sort of set in a kind of putative medieval setting with a putative kind of Renaissance Neoplatonist commentary on it. But actually, it's the young Coleridge's poem, glossed. We don't know quite when. 1815, 16, maybe. Maybe some of it even as late as 1817, for when the poem finally came out. So there's this extraordinary thing, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that as we get uh, more closely into the poem. So how, how, how could it be that such a young man, suddenly given the imaginative freedom, could have created this extraordinary thing, which became so resonant for him, and as I hope to show, will be resonant for us. At a purely practical level, I think what enabled Coleridge to write this great poem is that 
he, the pressure was off him because Wordsworth had said, why don't we just do this quickly for the magazine? It's not a heavy, important thing, just you get on with it. Now, Coleridge at that point was crushed down by a self-imposed burden of something deep, weighty, epic, heavy and important. We've got the letters that show this. He had just been given an annuity by the Wedgwood brothers of £150, which was meant to set him free to write poem, poems. Fantastic. No pressure then. So the financial pressure had temporarily been taken off, although they were still couldn't you know, get the money for the walk because the money for the annuity hadn't come in yet. But a huge thing, you are the next Milton. That's more or less what the Wedgwoods were saying to him. There's a letter to his publisher, Joseph Cottle, saying, I think I would take at least 20 years to write an epic and I'd 10 years for all this reading in the sciences and things and five years to write it and five years to revise it. It's a long list of everything he would do. I'm following the march of Milton. And he had in his notebook plans for essentially um, seven great poems, not one of which he actually wrote. And he beat himself up for not writing this. So these seven poems were going to be six major odes modelled on Pindar and full of classical references, four on each of the four elements, understood in themselves and then spoken of with the humours and the whole... In, would have been marvellous, you know, with the whole kind of um, uh, macrocosm, microcosm correspondences, but... but in with the new science as well, and you know his conversations with Humphrey Davies and beginnings of the Royal Society. So four great odes on each of the four elements, two odes on the sun and the moon, and then just in case the you know little time left over in the little cottage in Nether Stowey, which had two rooms and was constantly filled with smoke and crying children, um, an epic poem on the origin of evil and the fall of man. So, uh, just a minor agenda. <laughs> so, of course, having set this up and having been full of expectation for it, he was kind of crushed by this. And every time he sat down to start the epic, it was like, oh, ah. Yeah. So, instead, he wrote this other poem. And then spent a lifetime saying, do you know, I, I, I feel like such a total failure because I never wrote my epic on the origin of evil. Except if ever there was a great poem that totally expressed that mystery and darkness of our fall and whether it could be redeemed and what it means to shoot the albatross and what it means to have it hung around your neck and what it means in a single random act of stupid violence to break up and disturb a whole balance in the world and bring about the death and ruin of others and how, if it is possible at all, to recover from that. That was the ancient mariner. And you really want to be able to go back in time and say, look, relax, Esti. You did it. But he kind of never knew that he did it. And what about the four elements and the sun and the moon? Well, of course, the four elements are completely woven into the poem. All the reading he was doing for it sort of found its way out. And the sun and the moon, as I hope we'll see shortly when we look at the poem in a bit more detail, are absolutely crucial. And all the things he read, particularly in the Neoplatonists, about the symbolism of the sun and moon between direct and mediated knowledge are all there gently and beautifully in this ballad. But because it wasn't, the, wasn't task A, <laughs> he was somehow able to do it. And uh, as I was working on this book, I, I happened to pick up, you know, just randomly, because it was an attractive title, a little book called The Art of Procrastination. And um, it's written by a professor of philosophy at Cornell University, actually. And um, it's a really interesting series of observations. And basically what it says is that procrastinators, serial procrastinators, always beat themselves up and, and feel guilty about what they're not doing and what they haven't achieved. But he says, historically, if you look at procrastinators, or even if you are a procrastinator yourself, they often turn out to have done a lot. And he starts with a confession that says, you know, I'm a procrastinator and I'm always saying I didn't write that report. I haven't given the review of that book that I promised to that journal. And then he looks back at his own CV and his publications. Says, I have done quite a lot. And then he realizes I was doing that when I should have been doing the other job that actually the classic procrastination is not to flop on the couch and watch daytime TV. The classic, well, of course, now there's Facebook, but the classic procrastination is to do some other task that at that moment seems more congenial than the one you think you're supposed to be doing. So in this book, he suggests that we need to find a way of, of doing, as it were, organized procrastination, where we have to temporarily kid ourselves we have to pretend that dull routine 
task B is really task A and we must get on with it. And secret hidden desire, what we want to really write, is task B. Then we'll skive off from task A, the dull routine, and do the thing that we're meant to do. So um, that's what happened. That's partly how the mariner came to us, just out of sheer setting Coleridge free to do the thing. That he kind of enjoyed that liberty of he wasn't writing his big poem. But of course it was his big poem. <laughs> But years later, indeed in the same year uh, that he published finally this poem under his own name, he published Biographia Literaria, deep uh, reflection on the very nature of imagination and the poetic gifts. And we'll look at some vital things a bit later in that. But there's an extraordinary passage in that uh, in which he considers how the imagination philosophically, how it sometimes allows us to see or hold or understand something that we haven't yet grown into. This is what he says. It's about what he calls, at this point he calls it, the sacred power of self-intuition. It's not on the, the handout. We'll get to the handout later. But So here's what he says in, in Biography Literaria. They, and only they, can acquire the philosophic imagination the sacred power of self-intuition, who, within themselves, can interpret and understand the symbol that the wings of the air sylph are forming within the skin of the caterpillar. Only those who feel in their own spirits the same instinct which impels the chrysalis of the horned fly to leave room in its involucrum for antennae yet to come. They know and feel that the potential works in them even as the actual works on them. It's extraordinary. The potential works in them. Now, the image I'd like to take from that, you could do a lot with that, is this idea of the chrysalis of the horned fly. That here's this little creature which, in making the chrysalis, creates, as it were, an empty shape, creates and holds a shape and a form for the antennae it doesn't yet have, into which that sensitive antenna will grow in, and holds that space open, as it were, gives it form. The poet's pen turns them to forms turns them to shapes, that there's something about the imagination that leaps forward. He uses that as another image, again, from an insect, a little water beetle leaping up the surface of the water later on in the same book, that there is a power within us to intuit and to hold open and keep safe a space for something into which the fullness of our mind has not yet grown. That's why we need artists and poets. That's why we need the imagination. That's why we have a sense, don't we, of Blake. We haven't got him yet. We're going to get there <laughs> with Blake. And uh, I think Coleridge was able to write that passage in 1817. Oh, well, he wrote it earlier, but it was published in 1817. He was working on that at the same time that he was working on the glosses for the Mariner. And I think he'd begun to see that that is actually what he'd done in the Mariner. And I'd like to contend that he not only made a shape, as it were, and held open a shape, a narrative shape, a series of luminous images that leave room, if you like, and protect and create a space for the antenna yet to come in his own life. But I think he's done it for us. I think there are things in that poem, particularly about the way we relate to nature, the way we relate to other species, the way we think about our place in a much more complex web of life that we're only just beginning to catch up with. So uh, let's, let's sort of consider a little bit about that context. So Coleridge, of course, was writing The Mariner in, um, he gives it a medieval setting, and he's imitating he's, the fashion sort of earlier ballads. He's writing it when he originally wrote it in the lyrical ballads. It's got really, really old-fashioned spelling as well, and it's kind of based on kind of his reading of, of Percy's relics of the borderland and, and, and border ballads, as well as the kind of deliberately gothic, um, shock gothic ballads that were going around. So there's some of that 
But actually, the contemporary world in which he was writing it, and in which he subsequently, after some years, wrote the gloss, is that great um, cultural shift in the way we see things and configure things in the world, which we now, I think, call, with increasing irony, the Enlightenment, um, the beginning of modernity. And the poem, I think, is fully alive to that shift in crisis, and indeed is, I think, a parable about its failings and problems and a prophecy of their revolution. Um, there's interesting work going on at the moment. There's a, a writer uh, in America, a historian of culture called Thomas Fowl, um, the scholar at Duke University, uh, wrote a really interesting book recently called Minding the Modern, which is about the extent to which modernism and the whole modern project has constrained the way we see the world and narrowed the scope of what is possible for us to perceive. Um, and he deals with the mariner. He, 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 he writes in Minding the Modern about how the poem engages with the fundamental problems that arose before they'd really arisen, the problems that would arise out of a really rigid application of reductive materialism. And those were problems of alienation and anime, crisis over the very nature of personhood. And he says in his book, uh, Minding the Modern, he says, the ancient mariner is, quote, a parable about the philosophical predicament of modernity. And in the final section of that book, which is about how can we can recover, uh, that section is called Retrieving the Human, Coleridge emerges as something of a hero and a prophet for our times. And that's an opinion with which I entirely concur. Um, one of the things that Coleridge had said very strongly before he wrote The Mariner, when he was a radical journalist in Bristol, and in Bristol, of all places, was running uh, a very strong campaign against the slave trade in correspondence with Thomas Clarkson and Wilberforce, but actually right in the belly of the beast, you know, right where these things were. Isn't it? And there were kind of riots, and he nearly got lynched, and... Um, one of the things that he said in these early lectures against slavery in Bristol was that um, the reason why slavery is particularly abhorrent and kind of inimical to any moral understanding was that all moral discourse, he said, all attempts to live a good life and to treat other people well, all depend ultimately on the distinction between things and persons that the understanding of what personhood is and the, the gift to the other of their personhood and the recognition of, your, recognition of your personhood in their personhood and their personhood in your personhood, the distinction between things and persons is important for any understanding of, 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 of morality. But at the very core of slavery is a refusal of that distinction. It depends entirely on treating persons as things. And therefore, uh, it's not simply one moral mistake or aberration <laughs> you know, that you might choose to criticise as opposed to all the other moral mistakes and aberrations. It is, in itself, a complete undoing of any basis of moral choice because it fails to make that distinction. Um, in the poem, there's a very bizarre and strange sequence uh, in the Mariner where the, the dead sailors are sort of reanimated, but they're not themselves. I mean, it turns out later there's angels in them, but, but he has this weird experience of working next to these moving bodies. And he talks about the body of my brother's son, the body and I moved together. And there's this hideous vision of people as merely animated pieces of machinery. It's part of the kind of gothic horror in the thing. But it's actually also an emblem of what we make ourselves when we reduce the human person to just the unwinding of the selfish gene, just a bundle of neurons. And one of the things that he attacks in that poem and really attacked later in his philosophy was a reductive view of the world which has no room for inner consciousness, has no room for the statement, I am, but only for the statement, it is. <laughs> so um, uh, that's just a signal. I think I'm not the only person who's saying, actually, this poem has got something to say about the way we live now. That's uh, Thomas Fowle. So, so Coleridge is living and working in the midst of this process uh, of the beginning of the Enlightenment and of mo modernism. Um, he saw from within, as it developed, the deadening effect of a falsely rationalistic and materialist philosophy. 
So as a leading figure in the Romantic movement, he's, he's, he's uh, already part of a reaction against a purely mechanical and materialist view of the world. But unlike some of the other Romantic poets, he was concerned with more than creating beautiful fantasies as an alternative to grim reality. He wanted to challenge the reductive philosophers, the utilitarians, on their own ground and show that the insights of the imagination are insights into reality itself. So though he's best known for a handful of brilliant poems written in the course of the few miraculous years when he was a young man at the end of the 18th century, Mariner among them, um, he spent the rest of his life, 34 years, the first 34 years of the 19th century, reflecting on the meaning of that intense experience, on the experience of having been the mind through which such great works of the imagination as the Mariner had been revealed. And in this reflection, Coleridge found himself compelled to reject the mechanistic clockwork cosmos of Newton, to reject the distant and detached clockmaker that passed for God with many of his contemporaries. Instead, he rediscovered for himself a mysterious and suddenly present God, the one who speaks to Moses from the burning bush about the liberation of slaves the mysterious and all-sustaining word made flesh at Bethlehem. And after all his peregrinations, and uh, he went through many of them in terms of his philosophy and his religion, Coleridge, like his ancient mariner, did find a kind of haven and firm footing. He comes back, in a sense, to where he started. He was born, um, as you can tell, with many kind of strange stray poets and the kind of go wrong and indulge in excesses. It goes without saying that his dad was a vicar. Um, <laughs> so he was born in this vicarage in Ottery, St. Mary's. And in a sense, you can say he came back to that. He came back to a profound Trinitarian belief. But it was utterly transfigured and renewed. And one of the things I want to resist very strongly and, and talk about in this book is the later, the second generation romantics and indeed the third generation, so we're talking about you know, Byron and then on to um, you know, Byron and Keats and Shelley, and then we're going on to kind of Browning and Tennyson and Arnold and so on. They took the view that somehow, I think they're actually quite resentful of Wordsworth and Coleridge for surviving. <laughs> you know? um, there's a sense that when, they, when the generation after Keats, Shelley and Byron looked back, Keats, Shelley and Byron expired gloriously in the full prime of youth and never had the embarrassment of being middle-aged. Um, whereas, of course, Wordsworth and Coleridge not only became middle-aged, but old-aged. And, of course, Wordsworth famously, you know, took the pension from the, from the rotten government and, and became, of all things, the collector of, of stamp duty at, in Westmoreland. I mistook that when I was a little boy reading, you know, my first literary history. I, I thought he was a stamp collector. I thought he just liked collecting stamps. I didn't realise he was collecting an iniquitous tax, you know, from a monopoly from people who could not afford to pay it. And you remember Browning's, Browning's dismissal of Wordsworth, when Wordsworth, you know, um, to, just for a handful of silver he left us, just for a ribbon to stick on his coat. You know, that sense of the younger radicals being betrayed by the previous radical generation who'd become dull in old age. Now, Coleridge was tainted with that same brush. There was some feeling that because he wrote, you know, lay sermons and because he wrote theological works, because he wrote the amazing... Um, you know, uh, aids to reflection and that kind of thing, that somehow he'd sort of come back from, from romantic excess and settled down to a dull existence as a sort of, you know, adjunct of the Church of England. Now, he did, in a sense, become an adjunct of the Church. He did become a theologian. But I want to say he was, his theology, if you really read it, is a wake-up call to the Church of England itself and to the nation. It's a complete rethinking of what it means to be Christian from the ground up. And it involves a a, a, a radically different understanding, uh, and which is in a sense all anticipated in, in the Mariner. He prayeth best who loveth best. You know, all creatures, great and small, for the, you know, the, the, the dear Lord who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The trouble is that sounds incredibly trite because unfortunately Mrs. C.F. Alexander nicked the line from the Mariner, which comes at the end, and wrote, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. You know, which 
you, when you sing that, I don't know if you ever did this, when you sing that, and there's lots of little children singing it in Sunday school, you want to make up another verse that goes, all things vile and ugly, you know, all things horrible and square. What about them? You know, and that, of course, that is the very problem that's dealt with in the poem. The loathsome, you know, the poem has a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. You know? It's got a sense of absolute agony and dread. And it comes through that agony and dread to a renewal of love. And that's what makes it worth reading. It's like what, um, you know, what Karl Barth, the theologian, famously said about listening to Mozart, where he said, we accept the, the enormous yes at the heart of Mozart's music because it contains and overcomes a no. But, you know, sentimental Victorian hymn writers skimmed off the little bit at the end and made it sound trite. <laughs> But actually, when you say, you won't be praying unless you're loving all creatures. When you're saying that actually the disturbance that was created in all things was to do with your randomly killing a bird and making its death instrumental to you, rather than letting it be what it was, that's a very different thing that you're saying. So, um, let's, let's turn a little bit now... Um, Golly, time goes by. Uh, to the to the poem itself, like the Odyssey, it's it, it's uh, the shape of a, a, a journey out and back. A mysterious ship, the purpose of whose journey we're never told, leaves the familiar and sails south across the line into the southern hemisphere. Comes at last to the great ice flows of the Antarctic. The men are lost in fog and ice, but as we're told, remember, at length did cross an albatross. Thorough the fog it came. As if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eaten. Round and round it flew. The ice did split in a thunder fit, and the helmsman steered us through. So this mysterious bird, which appears as a kind of guide, that's how they get through. The, the boat has sailed all the way down across the equator down to the South Atlantic and is now finding a way around the horn. And he's going to say that... Um, they're going to make it now into the Pacific. It says, the, the, the bird which has been hailed as a Christian soul that shared the ship's hospitality guides the ship through the ice, round Cape Horn, and into the then unknown Pacific. You remember, we were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. The narrative at that point was suddenly taken out of it. The frame is interrupted. The wedding guest, our proxy, who's listening to the poem, obviously looks with horror at a complete change in the mariner's face, who's been telling the story. God save thee, ancient mariner, from fiends that plague thee thus. Why looks thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. And the rest of the poem goes on to explore the profound spiritual and material consequences of this seemingly random deed which, as the poem proceeds, takes on the resonance and spiritual significance of the primal fall of mankind, the fall of humankind, the fall of each of us. The crew, you may remember in that poem, make themselves complicit in the deed by taking, and this is key, a purely instrumental view of the bird. First, they say it was a bird of good omen, and they blame the mariner and say, oh, we're getting fog and snow, and we can't, you know, you shot the albatross, it was a good bird of good. They don't care about the albatross. They care about the albatross as an instrument for getting their stuff, so then they hang the albatross. But then they say, then of course the weather clears up, so um, they change their mind. And they said, "'Twas right, said they, to such birds to slay that brought the fog and mist." So it's not a question of whether the albatross has any rights or whether it has its own existence or its own proper reasons for being there. They just see it as an exterior object with no consciousness or selfhood which exists to serve their turn. And their dispute with the mariner is not whether it was morally right to kill the bird, but whether it was practically the right thing to do. Was it good to kill it because it caused good weather, or was it bad to kill it because, you know, so... But later on, we hear a deep, deep voice that says there is a spirit, they're told in dreams, that underneath the keel of the boat, nine fathoms deep, is a spirit which is the guardian, the tutelar spirit, the very kind of essence and personhood of the entire southern hemisphere of the globe. 
and there'll be another one in the northern hemisphere, these two polar spirits in relation to each other. Much later on, Coleridge was to develop what he called polar logic and think about the complementarity of opposites and the need to keep the poles of things in harmony. So this deep polar spirit, we are told in the, mariners, in the dreams of the other sellers, loved the bird that loved the man that shot him with his bow. Now that's extraordinary. Here's this beautiful, emblematic, guiding thing that's been hailed and entered into a kind of communion of hospitality, flying high with its great wings, visible. And invisibly, but strangely corresponding with it, deep, deep under the keel is this other spirit. And they're linked together in a kind of overarching and undergirding kind of architecture of love. That the invisible spirit loves the bird. And then we get the revelation, only after, long after the bird is dead, that the bird loved the mariner. So that the shooting of the bird becomes a radical disruption of a community of love, which is partly visible and partly invisible, and extends both to other species and to the invisible spiritual realities that undergird physical phenomena. But as it were, the mariners, even though this is supposed to be a medieval setting, the mariners are already well into a utilitarian material kind of instrumental view. Of, well, that's all dead stuff out there anyway. It's just objects. It's things. Not, so we can do what we like with it. But they know nothing. And they don't realize that they've disturbed, by this act, a delicate balance. And they're never going to get out. There's a real point, there's an extraordinary point when, you when the ship comes back to the line where it stops and it can't be released from the southern hemisphere until some kind of expiation has been done. And it all turns on how he treated this bird. Now, I don't know if you've come across anywhere, there's an extraordinary series of um, a kind of harrowing but very moving photographic uh, essays and... and about a place called Midway Island, which is in the South Atlantic. Uh, it's in the very waters through which Coleridge imagines this boat going. And as a photographer uh, from Seattle who's been there, and it's famous because it's where albatrosses breed. So these great birds that are making these huge sea voyages out and have to go back, obviously, to land to, to, to breed, and they breed on this island. And... Um, there's been a catastrophic drop in the albatross population and in the course of investigating that people naturally went to Midway Island which is, used to be a kind of whale oil oiling station and then we briefly kind of emerged again in the kind of dreadfulness of the Falklands War but they, they kind of went there and what they found was a horrific sight which was a series of the skeletal remains you could still see bits of dried feathers that hadn't decayed and the bits of bones, patterns in the grass of albatrosses but in the middle, in where the stomach cavity were just endless plastic cups, bottles, discarded plastic bags, squeezy tubes, stuff thrown over from ships, gathering and floating, brought by the currents. And they realized that what happened was that the albatrosses were picking up these things as though they were fish, feeding them to the, eating themselves and then feeding them to their young. And literally, the bodies of the, the, the stomachs of the birds were so full of empty plastic, that they could not eat enough food to nourish themselves. So with full distended bellies, they were perishing on this island. Obviously, a lot of them were perishing out at sea, but this island gave us the evidence. If you look up Midway Island and Albatross, you know, on the web, you'll see these photos. They're quite extraordinary. Now, if you want a symbol or an emblem of what is wrong, <laughs> what the final result the terrible line that went from the private, isolated, individual, consuming ideas in the world, cogito ergo sum, instead of we belong, therefore we are, which would have been the correct formulation, not I think, therefore. There's a kind of line, isn't there, from that until it eventually becomes I consume, therefore I am. I'm validated by making my purchase. Somebody wants to sum that up as Tesco ergo sum. But... <laughs> If you want an emblem of where we've got ourselves, then this great, beautiful, winged thing that could once fly, 
dying because it's full of plastic emptiness and has no room left for real nourishment. That's an astonishing emblem of what we're doing to ourselves in Western consumerist culture. And in the course of doing it, we're doing it to the albatrosses as well. But the albatrosses are maybe a kind of bellwether. You know, they're kind of the canary in the cage, if I can mix my bird metaphors. But, uh, you know, there's something there. And Coleridge sees that there's something about that bird and what it means. Um, so, the Coleridge, the poem goes on to tell of the death of the other sailors, the survival of the mariner in an agony of helpless guilt and isolation, in which he curses himself and every other living thing and wishes only to die. Because he kind of loathes himself. He loathes everything as well, and he can see no... And again, that's where we are. You know, the whole literature of anime and alienation and the fact that we're so kind of well-fed but actually miserable and kind of broken and cut off and we have this great crisis of meaning. Uh, all of those things are kind of um, echoed in the poem. Now Coleridge, by the time he got really into the stride and they'd finished the walking tour and he'd missed the, the deadline, did realise, although he didn't think it was his big epic and he still beat himself up for not writing the big epic, he did begin to realise that he'd got something here and pour a lot of time and eventually wrote 600 lines. And years later, years later, again in Biographia Literaria, he wrote an account of what he and Wordsworth thought they were up to in that extraordinary um, year of 1797-98. It's a very famous passage, you may remember it. He says, in this idea originated the plan of the lyrical ballads, in which it was agreed that my endeavours should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic, yet, this is a key line, so as to transfer from our inward nature a human entrance, and a human interest and semblance of truth, sufficient to procure, procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Mr. Wordsworth, on the other hand, was to propose to himself as his object to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite feelings analogous to the supernatural by, a, this is great, by awakening the mind's attention to the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us, an inexhaustible treasure, but for which, in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude, we have eyes, yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. Now that, in a sense, that eyes that see not, is that's where the mariner and his crew were, and what happens to the mariner is the awakening again, and that's what I want to get onto, because time is going by, which will be, we'll finally get to the handout. Um, so, I just want to notice, you to notice the, the, the two things from that passage, though. One is that he knows that as he writes about the outwardly supernatural and romantic, that he fully acknowledges he is also writing about your soul and his. He is transferring from our inner nature something. So, although it's a made-up story, it is also a true story. And if we can procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief, we will enter into truth. And that's why, you know, we have it and why we need the poem. The other thing I wanted you to notice is the word awakening. I think awakening is a really key word for the poetry of both Wordsworth and Coleridge. That it was awakening the mind's attention to the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and wonders of the world before us. It is the exact opposite of what subsequent generations, when the materialism had really got its iron grip, thought poetry and art were about. They then saw poetry as a kind of withdrawal, as a fantasy, as a kind of a, a beautiful, lulling dream that helps you keep going, you know, and, and allows you to get on the next day with the awful grimness. It was a withdrawing of the mind's attention from the sheer meaningless iteration of dead stuff in the world so it could have this nice gothic romantic dream. And that is an exact inversion of what, in fact, Coleridge wanted to do. And his poem should never be read as that, you know, 
fantasy that takes you away from what life is actually about. He was actually trying to tell you about your inner nature and awaken your mind's attention. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do in this, in this longer book, to sort of um, show that that's what he does. Well, you may remember that um, the mariner gets to this point of utter degradation in which he tries to die and can't, but in which his experience of self-loathing, as it were, infects his view of the world. And he looks out and he sees um, what the gloss later calls God's creatures of the great calm and sees them as loathsome, slimy things. And then um, something happens. At the zero point, something changes. In fact, um, the moon rises. The kind of low point of the poem comes when he realizes not only alienated from himself and alienated from all the things around and from the dead men on the deck, uh, but alienated from God. So you remember the famous verses, I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them close and the balls like pulses beat. For the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye and the dead were at my feet. That's where he is. And um, even the most beautiful of things, the, the luminous power of the sun at the beginning of the poem, the sun is kind of a great companion. By this point in the poem, when he sees the sun, he sees it as kind of peering at him out of a dungeon. And he sees it as kind of all in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon. He's in agony. And then an extraordinary thing happens when you look at the text of the poem. And I think you may have this now. We're finally getting to the handout. If you get to the handout and have a little look at the page that's got on the right, the moving moon went up the sky. And I've tried to reproduce it so that you can see how the gloss works. Um, the poem tells us that he's in this agony for seven days and seven nights, longing but being unable to die. And then we get the first intimation of change, first in the image of poem itself, and then in the course of what actually happens to the mariner. And the key, almost musically the signature that accompanies this change, is the image of the moving moon. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly, she was going up, and a star or two beside. Coleridge makes a beautiful and ambiguous play on the word moving. We have to do with a moving moon in every sense. The moon's very nature is both that she moves through space and is the cause of movement in others, the cause of moon movement in the tides, but that also she moves us. She moves us in our inner hearts and she moves the mariner in some way. And then right opposite is this gloss, which didn't appear when it was first published and which Coleridge in a sense only able to write when he looked back on this after he himself had, as it turns out, quite literally, that verse about seven days and seven nights trying to die. He lay in the absolute pit of destructive opium addiction, broken family life, utter ruination of everything he tried to do. In 1814, in a pub called the Greyhound outside Bristol, trying to die and screaming in agony. And it was only when eventually the landlady came up and kind of broke, in, broke down the door and eventually got a doctor to him. Eventually things began to turn around at the arrival of that doctor and eventually I think became like the pilot come, the pilot and the pilot boat at the end of the poem coming to meet the man. But it, so it had, did happen to Coleridge. But, and after this experience, he then wrote this gloss. Here's the gloss. In his loneliness and fixedness. Isn't that beautiful? It's extraordinary. In his loneliness and fixedness. He yearneth towards the journeying moon and the stars that still sojourn yet still move onwards. And everywhere the blue sky belongs to them and is their appointed rest and native country and their own natural homes, which they enter unannounced as lords that are unexpected and yet there is a silent joy at their arrival. 
It's extraordinarily long lost for a short burst. <laughs> and it has a huge amount more, as it were, than that's just in the, the moving moon went up the sky. There's something going on, remarkable in here. Um, the journeying moon, the stars that still sojourn. It's prose poetry. You can hear the journeying and sojourn going on there. Um, so at the lowest point in the mariner's journey, just when he's cried in agony that he wishes to die and yet he cannot, just at that point where his own journey seems endless and hopeless and home is an unimaginable possibility, just at that point comes a gloss whose imagery moves us from journeying to homecoming. Now, the narrative of the poem will not arrive at homecoming for many stanzas yet, but the hope of its possibility is mediated to the reader through the key words in the gloss. Look at the key words in that gloss. Just see them come out. Belongs, rest, native country, natural home. They gloss the text of the mariner's exile like the whispers of a good dream. He will, in fact, later dream of rain, and it will rain. He's suddenly being taken out of this stuckness and yet loneliness and fixedness by a sheer grace mediated by the moon. Um, the last phrase of that gloss, there is silent joy at their arrival, anticipates, I think, with its echo of Christ's words about the joy in heaven when the sinner repents, uh, the final homecoming of the mariner, even though at this point his homecoming seems least likely. Then comes the next verse. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watch the water snakes. There's a mistake in the typing here. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. The gloss says, by the light of the moon, he beholdeth God's creatures of the great calm. Now, if when you return to this poem, as I hope you will, and reread it when you get home, um, you'll see that just earlier, the very same creatures, the very same creatures, this is vital, have been referred to as a thousand, thousand slimy things. Now, they have become God's creatures of the great calm. Now, those of you who are familiar with Platonic and Neoplatonic writing and symbolism will be well aware that the sun and the moon have distinctive symbolic roles in that body of wisdom, and that the sun, which you cannot look at directly, you cannot face the sun directly, you, you see everything lit by a light whose source you cannot see, that the sun represents the direct intellectual knowledge without mediation of image of pure truth in the ideas. And the moon, because she bears the light of the sun and reflects it to us in a way which is, to borrow a phrase from Geoffrey Hill, brilliance made bearable, is symbolically, in that Platonic and Neoplatonic canon, uh, an emblem of the way in which the visibilia, the phenomena within the world that we apprehend of the senses, can, if we let it, mediate to us the light of an eternal truth. Not perfectly, but bearably. <laughs> and therefore has the possibility of transfiguring the way we see the phenomena at all. Am I making sense here? So I don't want to use that, 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 that there is, as it were, the, trans, the transfigurative adapted to a key of human perception is what the moon makes possible. Now, Coleridge had been reading Plato and the Neoplatonists in Greek since he was a schoolboy. Charles Lamb tells us that. I mean, he's extraordinarily full of these things. And somehow, you know, I think it slips into the imagery of the poetry. So something about seeing the water snakes in the moonlight helps him. So what happens next? Their beauty and their happiness, says the gloss. He blesseth them in his heart. The spell begins to break. What does the verse say? O oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart. And I bless them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I bless them unaware. The self-same moment I could pray. And from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sunk like lead into the sea. Extraordinary moment of release. Now, notice the order of events. 
This is not, as some of Coleridge's later critics have tried to say, a sort of, you know, Sunday school lesson and a religious diatribe where, well, if only you got right with God and did these things and you learned to pray and you got correct theology, then you'll be able to see things nicely. No, quite the reverse. It's about the way a beautiful grace and truth is mediated to him at the point where he's not seeing things well by the actual transfiguration of the very things he used to despise in that transfiguring light of the moon. And he responds with some deeper part of his soul, unaware, that blesses them, which surely corresponds with the spirit underneath, nine fathoms deep, that had loved the bird. He's now reconnecting, as it were, with those dislocated heights and depths in his soul. And then he can pray. That comes out later. He prayeth best and loveth best. Now that is a, something that Coleridge came to realise in a profound way and work out theologically later. So when we talk about Coleridge coming back to the church and back to the Church of England, which I, you know, I'm a priest in the Church of England. Hooray, I'm really glad. But the fact is that Coleridge came to that through a profound attention to the phenomena of, the, of nature and a realisation that the things you think are dead objects out there are not. They're living. They're all living. They're all part of one life. They are a language. As he was revising this poem, he finally finished it in February, uh, sorry, in March of 1798. But in February of 1798, he had had a little bit earlier on this wonderful experience of the little boy, Hartley, crying. Um, and taking him out into the moonlight and seeing the moon transfiguring and shining in the icicles on the cottage in February, and the little boy seeing the reflected light in the icicles and then reaching up to the moon itself and calming. And he went back inside, and a few days later, sitting up, he wrote Frost at Midnight. <laughs> the secret ministry of frost, quietly shining to the shining moon. And in that, he leaps forward to an amazing intuition about the phenomena of the world, where you may remember the famous passage where he imagines how Hartley will grow up and be uh, out among natural images. And he says, Thou, my babe, shalt wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountains and beneath the clouds which image in their bulk both lakes and shores. So shalt thou, this is the key line, so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who doth teach himself in all things, and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit, and by giving, make it ask. So something extraordinary was going on. So he had that kind of experience as a young man. And then, rather amazingly, having written this poem, he lost it. You see it in Dejection and Ode. Everybody thinks, oh, he was a great romantic poet because he took opium and had, like, groovy dreams. And Actually, he knew that the opium was killing it. You know, if you want to know which is the arrow that shot Coleridge's albatross, it was made out of laudanum. It destroyed the inspiration in the end. And he had to do this terrible journey of recovery from it before he could write again. But in the end, he did recover. In the end, he himself had as a kind of, as it were, a sort of second blessing in which, and he began to write about in Biographia Literaria. And I'm not going to have time, unfortunately, to go through with you the beautiful 13th chapter there. But you'll see, if you look at it, that he says there that every act of perception is itself an act of imagination. That the primary imagination is the prime agent and power of all perception. That's an extraordinary thing to say. And it goes back to the idea that all these lovely shapes and sounds are intelligible. He began to think of the cosmos itself as like a text or a poem that hands trembling between our inner consciousness, or I am, and the great I am, the consciousness that generated all things. And it, like a text, a poem only, poems don't exist in ink on paper. They're not poems, they're just shapes. You know, we could do a full chemical analysis of the rhyme of the ancient mariner in terms of the actual composition of the ink and the paper, and every bit of that analysis would be true, and we'd have no idea what it was. And we could tabulate geometrically all the shapes, and we could do, we could get an oscilloscope of somebody reading the poem and not bother to interpret the thing, and we could have huge, entirely accurate statistical volumes accounting for it, and not once would we have understood 
that it was a poem speaking to ourselves. And what Coleridge saw happening in the beginning of modernism was that we were doing that to the extraordinary dance and delicate text of the cosmos. And he recognized that we needed to recover a new way of reading. And that's eventually what he brought back. He once said to Lamb le later uh, in their lives when he, he uh, had returned to it, he said, he said, he said Lamb, did, did you ever hear me preach? Because at one time in his youth, he thought about being a Unitarian minister. So he was talking, they were remembering these days when he was going to candidate as a Unitarian. He said, did you ever hear me preach? And um, Lamb said, my dear Coleridge, I never heard you do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, it wasn't the preaching you would expect. Anyway, I'm going to have to draw stumps. I'd like to finish with a poem which I wrote in the course of beginning to follow Coleridge. And I'm not finished yet. I'm still following in that way. I'm still feeling after the way in which this poem has something to disclose, more to disclose for us, as it had things to disclose for him. But uh, as I've run out of my time, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this. Coleridge wrote his own epitaph. Um, and you can go and see it at Highgate. And it begins, Stop, Christian, passerby. Stop, child of God. And then it asks for prayer and talks about it. And it's so like the ancient mariner. You know, it is an ancient mariner. He stoppeth one of three. And I think his whole life, actually, and particularly his message to the church, I'm speaking as a priest now, was stop, Christian passerby. Rethink your theology. <laughs> Connect it with the entire web of life. Don't make it so parochial and so tiny and so just about solving one little bit of the person that you think is called religious. It's also about albatrosses and polar spirits and the rising moon. So anyway, uh, I wrote this poem for Coleridge, which I'll finish with. Stop, Christian passerby. Stop, child of God. You made your epitaph imperative and stopped this wedding guest. But I am glad to stop with you and start again, to live from that pure source, the all-renewing stream, whose living power is imagination, and know myself a child of the I am, open and loving to his whole creation. Your glittering eye taught mine to pierce the veil, to let his light transfigure all my seeing, to serve the shaping spirit whom I feel and make with him the poem of my being. I follow where you sail towards our haven, your wide wake lit with glimmerings of heaven. Thanks for listening. tell from the volume and continuation of the applause that that has been appreciated as a very fine lecture indeed and, and as I think something more than a lecture also, um, a contact with the true imagination. So thank you very much Malcolm and if that served as a, an excuse for procrastination in the course of writing your book on Coleridge then... Um, I think we can look at that with equanimity, and Terranos is proud to have provided the occasion. Thank you very much. Um, I realise that we're, we don't have much time in hand. I'm looking at Stephen at the back. Do we have time for questions? No. I fear we don't. I think we simply have to say a very profound thank you to Malcolm and to our hosts here tonight, and um, we, we will have to wind up there. So thank you very much, and perhaps a, a moment more of appreciation for Malcolm. Thank you.